our first question for tonight goes dear ajan i feel incredibly sad about animals who are suffering however these animals would have been in human realms many times they would probably have have had access to dhamma and find ultimate freedom from existence but they would have acted like most of the humans in this day and age and would have, in, would have engaged in sensual happiness. In fact, seeing this suffering is a lesson for humans who have the option of finding ultimate freedom from this existence. We are fortunate to have the option to achieve ultimate freedom from existence, but we engage in short term sensual activities and miss this rare precious opportunity even though we can clearly see the extreme suffering at the end of this lucky short period. Would Lung Po comment on this? Uh, yeah, I agree. This opportunity we're born as humans is like golden opportunity to cultivate your path towards Nibbana. It's the best realm, really, the most suitable realm to practice. It's not all a bed of roses, you know, human realm is a mixture of pleasure and pain. You have a human body, there's always going to be pleasure and pain. It is impermanent, we get older every day, we get sick, one day we're going to die. But that gives us all the fruits for cultivating insight into the nature of impermanence, dukkha, not self. And we still have access to the Dhamma. So if you're fortunate enough, you have enough good karma to have met with the Buddhist teachings, you can practice them, you've listened to them, you can practice them, well go for it. Do as much good for yourself and others as you can while you have your chance because life is totally uncertain. We just don't know how long we've got. You know, individually we don't know how long we'll live in this world and how long our good conditions will last our good health, our ability to practice is very uncertain. So use it because time is precious. Do as much practice as you can. Try and get, I would say, get make that central to your life, the practice of the Dhamma. On every level, the practice of dana, generosity, sila, morality, and bhavana. Cultivating mindfulness, developing insight into the way things are. Make that central to your life, whoever you are, you know, whatever your background. Try and incorporate the Dhamma into your lifestyle as much as possible. And it's possible to do that. You know, the more you give to the Dhamma, the more you'll get back from it. So don't be afraid of that. You know, there's plenty of obstacles. One of the obstacles is maybe people around you who don't have faith in the Dhamma will tell you you're wasting your time. <laughs> you know, they say, oh, that's not the way to success and happiness. You know, put all your effort into uh, your job, your career, you know, get your education, get your career, or maybe family and relationships and so on. And it's not that any of this is wrong, and you can do that as well, but I would still try and make the Dhamma practice central to all of this because it's what gives meaning to it all and it gives you the chance to really go deeper into your own mind and free it from stress and suffering on a daily basis we can do that so i think there may have been a raised hand from a participant uh, if you would like to unmute, you are welcome to ask your question now. Hi, Long Paul. I hope you're well. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, is it wrong to teach meditation as a livelihood where the intent is to benefit others who may not be keen uh, on the Dhamma? And the second question is um, I'm currently volunteering at a nursing home and assigned to a case where 
this old woman has anger issues um, where she hit other people um, after being provoked. <coughs> so I'm not sure how to encourage her to let go of her suffering um, or let go of her anger um, when she thinks that she's always in the right. Thank you, Ron Paul. Um, the first question was you were saying is it okay to teach meditation as a livelihood was that right so I assume you mean maybe teach for money is that correct Are you still there <laughs> Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Are you muted? I was just going over your first question. What was your first question again? Um, yes, that's correct. Sorry, I was muted just now. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as a livelihood to, to earn money. Yeah, um, well, we all have to learn earn a livelihood, so it should be okay. Um, I know when it comes to Sangha, we say, well, give the Dhamma for free and the Dhamma should be given for free. But this day and age, you know, there's a lot of teaching on lifestyle well-being. So I think there's a lot of people interested in it and maybe it's one way you can um, encourage people to practice, like you say, you provide it as a service and they because you need to live in the world well if people are willing to pay for it it should be okay um but just you like any other job you just have to separate out as you teach meditation you know and if you're charging well you all start to have some thoughts about how much you're earning and you know, how much you should charge and you've got to pay for this, pay for that, pay your bills. So you know, be careful, there will be some uh, attachment to the money and the, the, the profit you might make from that teaching. So just be, be aware of that. But that's the same for any job. It's not just meditation, teaching meditation. Any job you're going to have to deal with um, your attachment to, to money and any kind of greed that's stimulated. So that's why we also do dana. So say if you teach meditation for money, some, um, you know, maybe once a year or something, you might teach a, a meditation retreat or teach meditation course for free. Just maybe incorporate some dana, some generosity from time to time to to, uh, to help offset the fact that you're also earning money. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a thing, it's, I wouldn't say it's wrong livelihood or an inappropriate. So, yeah, it should be okay. Um, the second question, if somebody is an, uh, an elder, more senior person, and they're having anger issues, well, that's very common because as we get older, Sometimes our ability to control ourselves weakens and we do get irritated. Sometimes we have pain and stuff in our bodies. Sometimes it's habits from the past. But as our self-control goes downhill, often it comes out and people lose their temper more easily and maybe even they will strike out at other people. It's not at all uncommon. So number one, try to be compassionate, understand this person, maybe if you can get to know them, see where, what is stimulating the, this kind of angry behavior. If there's any way you can get them to have insight into their own behavior and where it's coming from, that will help. Um, if there's any way you can get them to become more aware of what's going on and recognize, well, this is a bad habit. This is something that is not good for myself, for other people, so that then they got the motivation. They want to change. They want to be more restrained, more careful. Anything that will help them to see that. So maybe getting to know them, investing time into talking with them, getting to know them so that maybe you can help them see where they're going wrong and maybe 
even get some, if you can, get them to the point where they, they have some technique or strategy ready for when they're getting angry. So instead of hitting someone, maybe they need to move away, if they physically can move away, I don't know the person and the situation, but if they can physically move away from other people when they're getting angry, you know, you get them to see that would be a good thing to do, move away. Uh, another one they can do is maybe go to the breath. When they're getting angry, go back to the breath, take a few deep breaths to calm themselves down. Um, I know one monk who used to get angry that he used to get so angry he wanted to hit people, so he would hit trees instead. <laughs> I know it sounds a bit unconventional, but you know sometimes you have to do something like that if you're somebody who just waves your arm around or you're willing to hit people because you're getting angry, well, maybe there's some other technique that you can introduce as say, well, when you're angry, squeeze this, hold this, or hit this sort of you got some little soft toy or something, I don't know. You maybe have to be creative. That's a suggestion and it may not work, I know, but giving them some strategies, some techniques that they can try and develop at the time they're getting angry so they've got something else they can do instead of hitting. I don't know how difficult it will be, but the more you give time you give them, the more you get to know them, the more chance you can help them. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Sadhu. We have another question here, which goes, I am new to Buddhism and I don't know how to progress my journey. Would it be a good idea for me to come and stay at the monastery for guidance? Maybe. <laughs> um, monasteries are not for everyone, but you know, say this particular monastery, we give a chance to people to stay for three, three nights at first. Uh, you can visit any day of the year, that, that's easy. But if you actually want to come and stay, well, just come for a few nights at first and you see what it's like. So it is one way you find out by actually doing it. Um, and people have different reactions when they go into a monastery. If, if they are brand new to Buddhism, you know, some people find it's not what they're looking for. So, um, some people find they they don't know how to be at peace with themselves in a, a monastery because a monastery environment is very simple. There's very little in the form of entertainment. There's no evening meal. It's a very kind of simple and disciplined kind of lifestyle. So some people react to that and they find it very difficult to just be with themselves on their own for hours of the day, you know, you spend some time with other people, but you also spend quite a lot of time on your own. And some people find that quite challenging. Other people love it. You know, they come into a monastery, they love it. They're peaceful. They like the peaceful environment. They like the activities. They like meditation, perhaps. And, you know, the whole thing works for them. So in the end, you can only try. And then you have to see what whether it helps you or not and you know some people it works some don't it doesn't you know, some people come to a monastery very idealistic they've got their idea how it should be and how they want to be but the reality is they're not ready for it so and they sort of have a quick burst of trying meditation try this try that and then suddenly they leave they depart as quickly as they came and it obviously wasn't for them <laughs> Other people kind of fall into it, you know, they just, a friend says, oh, try this, or they just, for whatever reason, in a more kind of random or haphazard way, they turn up in a monastery and maybe it's much better than they thought, or it turns out to be something good for them. There's every kind of situation you can think of, I think. So in the end, you just try it and see what happens. One thing you can be sure of in a monastery, a Buddhist monastery, you know, it's, you're going to be fairly safe and you get some advice, some help. So 
you know, is is something you can try, you know, as opposed to some other things, you know, you might might not want to try snowboarding because you might break your leg or something. <laughs> I don't know. You know, some things you, you you can't just try, other things you can. And in a monastery, well, you can always try it, even just for a short time, one night or something, and see what happens. Yeah. You have another live question? Hello. Thank you so much for sharing the wisdom with us, Hajan. Um, I have a question about the practice of uh, Satipatthana and uh, Anapanasati. Um, in a sutta, Bhagava, uh, Bhagava instructed regarding the Satipatthanas, a bhikkhu dwells absorbing the body in the body, ardent, diligent, thoughtful, having given up covetousness and grief towards the world. He later gives the same instructions towards feeling the mind and uh, Dhamma. And regarding Anapanasati, the blessed one instructed, he trains himself, feeling the whole body, I will breathe in. He trains himself, he feeling the whole body, I will breathe out. And my question is, how should one practice it? Uh, the practice instruction seems to be on the surface, but could Dirajan elaborate on the instruction of uh, of the practice? How exactly should it be practiced? Should the instruction be taken literally, or is there something between the lines that uh, one needs to be mindful of? Uh, kind of both, like. The Anapanasati Sutra I've always found very helpful and very straightforward. But then, as you know, the Buddha taught many suttas and many different things on different occasions to different people. So there's a whole range of other aspects to the practice which are obviously not mentioned in Anapanasati. So there are certainly other parts of the practice that can be developed and will help with your practice of Anapanasati. But the simple teachings of learning to be mindful of the in-breath and the out-breath from moment to moment, it's so simple we overlook it. And most people never quite get there. <laughs> they they do that for a while and then they're on to wanting to learn something else or think about something else. But that instruction from my experience, it really works. You practice being mindful of in-breath, out-breath, and you keep with your in-breath and your out-breath to the point where you let go of the other mental hindrances, distractions, sleepiness, then you be, your attention will be firmly established in the body and turned inwards. You, know, you, you let go of all your concerns about the rest of the world and business and the past and the future while you're doing this. And it will change your whole way of looking at yourself and life and one thing is you become much more aware of this internal uh, breath body and the way you, know, you become aware of the body from the inside. And that helps you to understand and know your own mind better. It helps to know how the relationship between your mental state and the breath. And from there, you be uh, following the, the the steps of the sutta. You know, you can cultivate developing pity and sukha, you know, happiness, joy, happiness, rapture, and then your mind, because you're calming down, body and mind become much more calm, more still. Then you can contemplate, as the Buddha said, contemplate um, impermanence, for example. When you you're more, you're experiencing stillness and well-being impermanence becomes much more obvious and it, you you can really reflect on it and see it as it is in your experience so generally speaking i found the anapanasati sutta is very valuable and and correct but it's you know it's fairly short and brief so there are also other things that you can use to help so like you know it doesn't talk about well, what do you do if you're practicing anapanasati but anger arises? Well, you can also cultivate 
say, the thought of uh, loving kindness, to deal with that anger, and then you come back to the Anapanasati, say, you know, that's not mentioned specifically, but if you expand the Anapanasati Sutta out, well, you, you'll find it's there in the sense, you know, we say, setting aside delight and aversion for the world. So, Anapanasati Sutta practice may be in conjunction with other, other teachings from the Buddha, I think is a very good way to practice. Maybe not for everyone, because there are different aspects of the practice that certain people resonate more with, but I've always found it very, very effective and very, a very good structure to start with. And maybe uh, through experience, you may also incorporate other aspects of, of the Buddha's teachings, other reflections and so on. Thank you so much. Okay, we have another question here. I tend to live an alone lifestyle. How to contemplate loneliness that sometimes come rushing in the mind? Yeah, I think that's a very common experience. Um, although the practice of living in seclusion or on your own is, is very, you know, it's part of training yourself, you have to learn how to be at peace with yourself. You know, the Buddha didn't encourage us to completely cut off from the world because you, know, you need to have relations with other people, but just how you earn a living or how you interact with the world, you know, there's a certain amount of interaction with other people. Like for instance, like Buddhist monks, we spend a lot of time on our own. We also have periods where we're not talking very much. But the Buddha actually made a rule that monks as a, mon as a community can't stop talking to each other, shouldn't stop talking to each other, or, you know, live in silence. Sometimes it's necessary to interact, to speak, albeit speak skillfully and with kindness and say that which is useful. But it's a necessary part of life skillful communication. Uh, if you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, one aspect of the P Noble Eightfold Path is the practice of right speech, right livelihood, right action, right speech. So the Buddha didn't advocate everyone should just be on their own alone, but there is a time and place for it. You know, there's times when we go on retreat, time when we spend alone, and that's very useful, can be very useful time. and you know, we know the drawbacks of a lot of socializing and, and you spend a lot of time with other people. It, it's time consuming and you have to spend time with doing things and working out how to get on with other people. So time alone can be very valuable, but we should perhaps also cultivate kindness and compassion in life, which may bring us to engage with other people in different ways. So the Buddha encouraged us to practice looking after our parents in particular, um, practicing generosity in different ways, you know, looking after the sick, the poor, helping the people around us, or just being friendly to those people around us that we meet in the course of our lives, you know, work colleagues, neighbors, and so on. Maybe that's something you have to cultivate if you experience loneliness. Well, maybe see where you can um, go out and help other people just sometimes, occasionally, on whatever level, to whatever extent you feel comfortable with, you engage with the world uh, from a place of compassion and just giving something back to people. Because to live in this world, we, we can't live in this world totally alone. You know, you, you don't produce all the food you eat, you don't produce the clothes you wear, and so on. There's, there's a, 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 we we depend on other people for our education. We depend on our parents for so much. We depend on other people for education, work, the things we use in this world for getting on, getting about in this world. So maybe we should also look at what we can give back to the world in small ways, in bigger ways. That's up to each individual. But 
That's also a way to counter loneliness, is you give things back. Are there any more final questions? Looks like that's the, all the questions tonight, Mungpo. Okay, very nice talking to you all tonight, and we wish you well in your practice, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>